Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our second Reformed Church Center colloquy exam looking at the question of understanding theological education in the Reformed Church in America. Today's colloquy will focus on New Brunswick Seminary itself and the ways in which things, things are always changing here. And so looking at what the challenges were in the past as we look forward to the future. Our three participants have been folks responsible for getting New Brunswick Seminary through things in the past. Robert White served as president of NBTS from 1985 to 92. Before that, he served churches in Clover Hill, New Jersey and North Sy Syracuse, New York, and worked as RCA minister for social witness back in those days when the RCA staff was actually at 475 Riverside Drive in the Inner Church Center. After leaving New Brunswick, he was called to be senior pastor of First Reformed Church in Schenectady and was designated minister emeritus there in 2006. He then served as interfaith chaplain at Bethesda House in Schenectady, an inner city ministry to the homeless and working poor, and as interim executive director for the New York State Council of Churches. Dr. White and his wife, Joanne, now enjoy retirement in a very nice log house up on Peck Lake in the Southern Adirondack Mountains where there is not a reformed church for miles around. We will reflect later on whether or not that was coincidental or planned. Norman Cansfield followed Bob White as president of NBTS and was president from 1993 to 2005. Before he was at New Brunswick, he was librarian at Colgate Rochester Divinity School, Beth Bexley Hall, Crozier Theological Seminary and St. Bernard's Institute in Rochester, New York. And before that, at Western Theological Seminary, which holds the distinction of being the seminary with the shortest name in today's program. And now in his retirement, also lives lives in the woods near a lake, um, but he is in the he is in the Poconos with his wife Mary, and he spends time as theologian for the Zion United Church of Christ in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. Renee House was dean of New Brunswick Seminary for two stints. She did it once and then said, "Oh, I can do that again." In fact, I sat at a coffee with, with Renee once and she said about her second stint, this is only going to be for one academic year, I've been promised. I, think, I don't think I laughed in front of her, but I thought about it. It was not for one academic year, but she did a stellar job as Dean. Um, and since 2013 has been serving as pastor of Old Dutch Church in Kingston, New York. And so we are glad to have all three of them with us. We are going to go in historical order, so Bob will get to speak first. Dr. White. 50 years of RCA theological education. I, I can't believe it's been that long since I served as a student uh, representative on the bi-level multi-site design team. The goal of that project was to unite the two seminaries and theological education in the denomination under one board, one administration, one combined faculty, one four-year program involving residents of all students first at New Brunswick for two years and then at Western for two years. Uh, it was an ambitious and forward-looking plan. But it was designed to serve one kind of student, white, male, young, full-time, and RCA member. 
And that's one of the main reasons the grand plan failed. We were planning for yesterday. The program began in 1970 and lasted until 1973. I believe the decisive event in the last 50 years for New Brunswick Seminary at least, was the inauguration of President Howard G. Hageman in 1973 in the midst of all the confusion uh, because of the uh, BLMS disillusion. There's planning, but there's also epiphany. I believe that Howard Hageman's vision for the seminary was inspired and he spelled it out in his inaugural address. I long to see the day when some classes at New Brunswick probably held in the evening involve seminary students, members of minority groups, ministers and lay people together. I think the mix would be rewarding for all of us. Howard's vision was to make reformed theological education accessible to many, many other kinds of people besides full-time white men, available to a wide variety of people, diverse gender, race, age, denominational affiliation, to people not so secure in terms of personal resources or available time. When I arrived 12 years later, I found it was all in place. An evening program as well as the day program in New Brunswick and a thriving evening program uh, in conjunction with the uh, f uh, theological faculty at St. John's University in Queens. It had been done. And it was because of Howard's vision and the willingness of the faculty to sacrifice, to make theology acceptable to others. Imagine teaching during the day in New Brunswick and then getting in your car to drive all the way to Jamaica, Queens and teach for three hours that evening and then drive back. Sacrifice. Howard and that faculty brought New Brunswick Seminary and Old School into a whole new and bright era. Of course, there were problems. Since John Henry Livingston's unpaid salary, the seminary has lived through many years that were lean and some that were fat. I arrived to uh, find an accumulated budget deficit from prior years of $1.8 million and an unrestricted endowment of $450,000. And that was perilous even for a small seminary. And so the unified board still in existence after BLMS mandated a balanced budget for the next year. And that required budget cuts of one third. It required the elimination of three faculty positions and a third of the administrative positions and cuts all across the board. And it was terribly painful. And I hope, and I think it's long forgotten, except by the people who lived through it, including James Brum and Renee House, members of that extraordinary class of 1987, who stuck with us to a person and went on to serve Christ and the church so well. The RCA stuck with us too. Alumni and generous congregations and very giving individuals 
and a denomination-wide fund drive at that time that, that netted 1.2 million for the seminary. So in a short time, we were able to rebuild a more diverse faculty to appoint the first full-time woman professor to promote, appoint two African-American professors and gradually to make the faculty more diverse and more like the students whom they were teaching. I was grateful for all that financial support that bailed us out, but I was uneasy that one small denomination was supporting a seminary now serving students from 20 different denominations. Uh, a quick story. One fall I was greeting new students and I welcomed a young man from Korea, Man Sok So. And I said, why did you choose New Brunswick Seminary? He said, this was Horace Underwood's school. Well, of course. He said to me, do you know who I am? I am the great, 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 great grandson of the first Korean Horace Underwood baptized in 1885, which was pretty awesome. But what he said next was really important. He said, I don't intend to go back to Korea when I graduate. I want to be a missionary to the United States. So many Americans need to hear the gospel. Well, I went across the Reformed Church telling that story. We have a great missionary tradition of us giving it over to them. Now, church, we need them to bring their vitality from around the world to the missionary situation here. And there's no better place or no better missionary con context than New Brunswick Seminary in the middle of the vast New York metropolitan metroplex. Well, they heard and, and supported. And I, uh, I spent time every year at the three Reformed Church colleges meeting these bright, committed, smart, gifted young people out there. And I said, why don't you come to New Brunswick for seminary? Why preach to the choir? Come on out where you will experience the wonderful diversity of Christ's church and the community of its people. Come out and learn in one of the most difficult missionary contexts in the world. And boy, they came, a lot of them. Um, I remember for, for several years in my time, we had more students from Iowa than Western Seminary had. And I felt good about my competitive part, felt good about that. They came and the, they were not only great students, the campus never looked better because those people from Iowa knew how to mow lawns and plow snow and lift heavy, do heavy lifting. And I won't soon forget the student focus group I sat in on when a young Midwestern male was complaining about the apathy of so many people in the churches. Seated next to him was a wonderful, assertive, kindly, middle-aged black woman. And she leaned over and put her arm around that young man and said, well, why don't you just come with me to my church in Newark? The mix, the holy mix on the holy hill. Um, I'm talking uh, a little long. 
I want to just mention a few, mo most of the good things happening there were were happening in the mix because of the faculty and the students and the staff. And I, I blessed them, but I wasn't that much involved. There were a few things I tried to do for the school that I hoped would help those who came after me. Norman can tell you if I'm not telling the truth. Uh, board governance. There was still that unified board from the old BLMS days governing both Western and New Brunswick and then that new theological education agency uh, was added to the mix. About 20 very good people, but there was triangulation and a lack of focus which accounted for earlier financial problems and uh, New Brunswick, I con was convinced needed its own book governing board to include representation of the constituencies we were now serving and to whom we wanted to look for support. They had to have a voice in governance and, and the, the future of the school. Finally, as I was walking out the door in 1992, the General Synod approved a board, separate boards for both of the seminaries. Uh, also, for years and years, essential programs and agencies of the Reformed Church were funded by a per member assessment of the General Synod upon congregations that was never done for theological education. I said, why not? Are we not essential? Pushed and pushed, even though my counterparts at Western and T uh, had qualms, it was done. And for the first time, an assessment for theological education became one other source of income for both schools. We were not successful in my time very much in gaining financial support from the other denominations uh, and congregations we were serving. I hope that has improved since. Um, it used to be that administrative tasks were done by ministers who had some little aptitude or sideline. Uh, administrative tasks like keeping the books and supervising the grounds and raising funds, almost always done by ministers through, through our history. Uh, when, I, when I came to New Brunswick, there was one used computer in the bookkeeper's office donated by a board member. And I really believed that in, in a growing high-tech, quick-changing, complex society, the seminary needed administrators almost as, as qualified and educated as the very fine faculty that we had. And steps were taken in that direction that significantly increased the competence in key administrative positions. Um, one last thing, I, I did play a active role in the founding and funding of a new chair for urban ministry, Metro Urban Ministry, uh, a kind of new field of study and practice at that time, uh, and one very much needed by a majority of the students in our seminary, uh, that, that appointment was made. Those who followed me can, can perhaps speak about the difference that Warren Dennis's presence made in the, uh, the content and consciousness of uh, the seminary. Uh, and, and I want to end with this. In 1992, a black truck driver named uh, Rodney King 
was arrested by the police in Los Angeles and viciously beaten. And it was caught on videotape. And that tape went, as we say today, viral across the nation. And outrage began to build. And four of those officers were uh, indicted, tried, and acquitted. And violence broke out all across LA. 63 people were killed in those riots, arson and uh, looting and all, uh, all kinds of terrible things. In New York, Mayor David Dinkins called out to the people and said, yes, it's an outrage. And yes, we must protest, but please make it peaceful. And it was. And there was very little violence in New York City through that whole, it, it went on for weeks. And when the situation cooled, I heard Mayor Dinkins on NPR speaking to thank the people of New York. And he said, I especially want to thank the clergy of New York City for being out there in the streets, increasing the peace. And I pulled out our alumni directory and paged through it, and I counted over 100 graduates of New Brunswick Seminary serving congregations in the city of New York. And I'll bet there are quite a few more than that today and I'm sure that they are better prepared today to increase the peace wherever they serve in the spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Norm, let's hear from you. Bob has just made very clear how indebted I am to him for uh, the years that I was at New Brunswick. Uh, in so many cases uh, throughout my ministry, I have had the privilege of, in a sense, following Bob. And every one of those cases, I ended up in his death. Right after that common board of theological education, uh, or just before they were dissolved, uh, they called me to the presidency of New Brunswick. So I've always been grateful that there was that common board and that they took that act. As soon as they had done that, Bob and Joanne, who had already moved to Schenectady at that point, invited Mary and me to join them for a day in which uh, they would share with each of us and both of us their insights about New Brunswick. And about the finances, I remember in particular that Bob said that he thought he had been able to plug most of the major leaks in the old ship, but it still rode very low in the water. Now, for a kid from Homewood, Illinois, that's pretty good seamanship. The real financial difficulty with New Brunswick remains that it has had more lean years than fat years, and it still is uh, short on extra cash or even abundant cash or even necessary cash. But Bob did a wonderful job of making it stable enough for it to face the challenges of the preparation for ministry in dynamic new ways. And Bob, I thank you for that. The most powerful event to occur during our years at New Brunswick was of course, uh, uh, September 11, 2001. And in a way, that changed everything for all of us, for the church, but 
New Brunswick was forced to look at some things in some very different ways. And that's a part of that experience for which we have to give thanks to God. Richard Lichty, who was one of the pastors in, in Bronxville at the time, uh, commenting on the fact that people rushed back to church. There was a 6% increase nationally in church attendance. That's 20 million people. Unfortunately, by the following Christmas, they were gone. And it was Lichty's insight that said, they came back to church just long enough to remember why they had left in the first place. And that the fact that they stopped coming is not their fault, I think, is what he was saying. It was our fault for being part of a church that was not prepared, really, to minister to them in their moment of tragic need. For the, the seminary, that forced us into a whole lot of new ventures. It gave a, a context to the relationship with Korea that Bob has already mentioned. It gave us the opportunity to go to Korea and see how they did church from the perspective of a nation that was very little, if, if in any way, officially Christian. How did they manage these huge congregations and this tremendous success of the church when they had so few of the opportunities that were natural to us? We learned from Korea, and interestingly, we began to recognize Korea as a powerful source for help with the funding of the school as well. They were very generous. They understand that uh, to be the church in today's world relies on generous giving. The Presbyterian Church in Korea has become an enduring friend to New Brunswick Seminary. And for that, we have to say thanks to God. We had a beginning relationship with the African Methodist Episcopal Church prior to 2001. We had officially a member on the Board of, of Trustees appointed by the Bishop of the First Episcopal District. And that position was assured from transition to transition. There was always to be a, an AME trustee on the New Brunswick Board. The trustee we, we were sent was an astounding person, very generous with time and insight. And from that relationship with the AME Church, we began to be taught about how gospel has to sound for African Americans. It was, our, our general intention was to go with the way we had learned uh, a generous white Christianity. We tried to be generous, but our AME brothers and sisters made clear that there was more to real interaction than just being generous. And they showed us the way. Another astounding insight came when we had the opportunity to partner with the Blanton Peel Institutes of Manhattan. Arthur Caliandro uh, gave the commencement address in 2001. He was president of the Board of Trustees for the Blanton Peel Institute and suggested that there might be a possibility for the seminary and the Blanton Peel Institute, which were, the institutes were committed to pastoral psychological therapy within the church. He saw that combining the two programs could help us be better prepared for meeting the intense uh, psychological 
and social needs of persons after disasters like 2001. We actually owned the Blandon Peel Institute for a little more than a year and a half when the regents of the state of New York decided it was un unlawful, illegal, for a New Jersey institution to own a New York institution. And they weren't much impressed by the fact that New Brunswick had been founded in New York City. That, that didn't work with them. A few years too, too early, I suppose. So we had to break up the relationship officially, but not give it up in terms of how we could interact with each other, learn from each other, and be more useful. Just before the end of my tenure, I had the opportunity to go with Lewis Scudder, one of the great missionary minds and spirits within the Reformed Church for a trip to Lebanon and Palestine to meet with uh, theological educators and institutions mm -hmm. in the Near East to learn how it was that they could educate for ministry without bias against Islam. How could they manage to educate in an Islamic Arabic environment and at the same time be authentic Arabic Christians uh, when the person got out to be minister, pastor, teacher in their present environment. That also was a great learning experience. And i am always been sorry that New Brunswick hasn't been able to benefit from that as much as had been hoped. But 9-11 made clear to us why that had to happen. And now we know that there are persons in the Middle East who can be useful to the ongoing responsibilities of theological education. I'll learn to say that word sooner or later, education, uh, in our, our, uh, our present uh, sphere of responsibility. It was a, a great, experience to be with them, to learn from them. And uh, I trust that in the future, we will find increasing ways that we can pass that benefit on to students and the church. There is one other thing that I need to say, and that is that Theological education has tended to look at the product of theological education as a person in a parish or in a specific ministry. My sense is we have to learn to look through the parish to see what those individuals that we're teaching will really face. We need to equip them for automatically looking at the area around their church buildings as the beginning point of where the church is being called. We need to help them to see the vast possibilities that lie beyond simple maintenance of congregations. And we need them to be better prepared to take an active part in the structures of Christianity that are beyond the congregation for the Reformed Church in America, the classes and the synods. We have not been very good at helping people be effective church persons in planning for the work of the broad church, the whole church. I think we've done a good job of planning for congregational life. We can be proud of that but there's still this other challenge that is there. I leave that challenge to the church with gratitude. Thank you, Norman. Renee House served as Dean for a while while Norman was president and then as Greg Mast was president, and was a student when I was a student and we um, you know, tried to do New Brunswick Seminary without extravagances like lights and chalk for the chalkboards and things like that. Um, 
do-it-yourself seminary we had, but we did okay. And so it's good to be able to welcome her as she shares her reflections on, especially at the time while she and Greg were running things. I was just thinking as you were talking, James, that probably it was to our great advantage that the seminary fell completely apart while we were there. And we had to live through that chaos, which was really good preparation for parish ministry. So I uh, came to New Brunswick Theological Seminary in 1984 as a second career student, just as the seminary was beginning to do its evening theological education. I lived in Manhattan. I got on the six o'clock subway for my eight o'clock Greek classes. I met a bunch of guys who lived in a halfway house up the street from me in Manhattan. So I was the beginning um, of this great experiment to move from being a sort of all white male seminary to becoming a really diverse seminary. I, I lived with and through the administration of four presidents. When I came, Howard Hageman was the president. We used to stand on the uh, ramp of the library and smoke and put our cigarette butts in the Sculpty Reading Hall. Then, but it was um, under Bob White's administration that I was called to be the librarian, thanks to the recommendation of the Reverend Dr. James uh, Norman Cansfield. Then while Norman was the president, I became the dean of the seminary. I left that position for a while and then came back into it while Greg was the president. And I'm really mindful today that if Greg were alive, he would probably be in my place. Really mindful of uh, what a big loss it is for the whole church to be without him and really honored to be here and speak sort of also of his time as president. I got to tell a personal story to start. I'm going to do something quite different from the two presidential administrator people and just sort of give some frame to my whole experience. I was almost at the seminary for 30 years, which is a really long time to be in seminary. This uh, personal story kind of shapes my way of thinking about the history and the present and the future of this of theological education, but also about the life of the church in society. When I was asked to preach at the General Synod of 1992, which was just a few years after my ordination, I was the first woman who would do this in the long history of the church. And Bob was the president then, and he said to me, these are my words, Bob, you didn't say it exactly like this, but he said to me about preaching, don't do a feminist thing. Don't draw attention to yourself being a woman, but show up as a minister of word and sacrament, which I understood to be that in the midst of the diversity, which was then the general synod, where there were people who were both supportive of and opposed to women's ordination, that I would just be present as someone who was authorized, called, ordained to preach, that I wouldn't um, you know, sort of make an argument for it. I wouldn't blame people for it. I would not do things that were offensive, which you, know, you can't control that, Bob, if I do things offensive. But I, t I understood at that point what it meant, what you were saying to me. And that is even though I embody something as we all embody something that I would be present as a minister of the gospel and I would be working out of the grace of God, that I would be present in grace. So I've been thinking about that the reality of embodiment and seminary education, uh, particularity within the midst of diversity and what that means for us and also for our society, which obviously is incredibly divided now in its diversity. 
In, uh, I, thanks to John Copley for the recent history of the seminary. It's been a really wonderful thing to have this quite condensed look at 50 years of history. After the demise of the bi-level multi-site, um, which some of that DNA persists in the seminary's DNA, and I'll, I'll mention it in a bit, um, John Coakley writes in his book that Howard Hageman stepped back from the innovations of the bi-level multi-site, which were really focused on the how and what that the seminary would teach and envisioned this innovation in the matter of whom the seminary would teach. And for me, that's where the, the embodiment piece comes. It's how human beings became the curriculum of New, Br New Brunswick Theological Seminary and probably the most profound curriculum to be formed in that kind of diversity while surrounded or, or engaging the particularity of our own church traditions, et cetera. So it's, and, and I was thinking about it, um, especially in response to an article that came out in June from Caroline Randall Williams. It was in the New York Times where when the Confederate monuments were being pulled down and people were objecting to this kind of rewriting of history or this abolishment of history. And the title of her article is, you want a monument? My body is a Confederate monument because she is a person, as she says, um, the black people I come from were owned and raped by the white people I come from. So this is the particularity of her story and her body um, tells that story and her embodiment tells that story. So I, I've been thinking about that, the particularity in the midst of diversity at the seminary and also I think that the seminary not on purpose evolved an educational philosophy, which takes seriously what Michael Pogliani says when he says that knowledge arises not by overcoming the particularities of the various traditions, and I would say communities and the particularity of our skin, but rather by deeper immersion in these particular traditions and communities and bodies and the various practices that sustain them all. So in terms of how this attention to particularity in the midst of diversity emerges and in New Brunswick's history, I look at the, the diversity of the student body that starts to occur because of our offering accessible education in the evening. So we get a, a growing diversity, especially first of African-American students, diversity of women and Asian persons. But I do think of Warren Dennis's appointment to the faculty in urban ministry as watershed events. He came to the seminary 1992. And without our knowing it, the rest of us, that is, he was subverting the institutional identity in very intentional and quiet ways. And it meant that he made alliances. This is so the board was diversifying, Bob, out of your administration, increased diversity, Norman, out of your administration. So critical mass of African Americans in student body on the faculty and on the board. And, and what Warren did is make alliances with students and board members, sometimes in ways that felt in opposition to the white faculty and organization. So those kind of loyalties within the faculty were breaking down. And I was thinking, Norman, too, of your arrival with us from Colgate Rochester and on our first retreat, I don't know if I remember this correctly, but you propose that we reorganize our departments in a post-colonial kind of way. So that you were critiquing the sort of historic divides in the European Western theological curriculum and saying, let's organize ourselves 
on the basis of our bodies, I would say, our being male or female or African American or Asian, let's cut across departmental lines and reorganize ourselves. So there's this incredible um, reality of suddenly paying attention to personal and tradition identity. But here's where the BML, BLMS kind of norms came back through. And that was a curriculum that was very much focused on contextual experience. So students were serving on the police force and hanging out in the bars and talking to the prostitutes on the street corners in New Brunswick. And out of that experience, designing courses and trying to integrate the coursework and, and their own experience. And I would say their own personhood. And so the curriculum at New Brunswick persists in this that, and uh, I'm just gonna read something here cause I had to write it down. Um, that the, the theological education enterprise is an interpretive enterprise and interpretation is a, f a form of, of life. So it's interpretation and integration of sacred texts, sacred traditions, context, cultures, and our own individual experience. All the time we're trying to put these pieces together, but we're interpreting all of those things while we're putting them together. So I taught this course, Texts and People, multiple times where we were asking students to write their own biography, autobiography. And then we looked at maybe 10 interpretations of Genesis one through three from various historical and theological traditions. And then we, we um, looked at our context out of congregational studies, like what's operating here. And then we are asking pe students to put all of those pieces together as the kind of core um, educational paradigm that we're working with, listening, being who we are in our particularity, in our context with awareness of um, our particularities. So it's just, uh, I want to get quickly to the anti-racism team, which finally emerges in 2007. So Warren Dennis came in 1992 with this increasing diversity, but it's not until 2007 that we move into this sort of critical consciousness work as white people and as people of color, so that we are both at the same time discovering who we are in ways that we didn't recognize before, like for me, coming to terms with my internalized white privilege and superiority, while, while African-Americans and other people of color were coming to terms with their internalized oppression. And at the same time, then we're discovering this identity and we're also engaged in its unmaking by being in the conversation with each other. So we are learning our particularity and then we're unlearning our particularity and we're constructing our particularity anew. And I just wanna end with this. Um, so while, while we're working at these particular identities, whether that be tradition, denomination, um, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, whatever it might be, I come finally to this place. I was thinking about Calvin who says, the only true knowledge is knowledge of God and knowledge of self. And there's no true knowledge of self without true knowledge of God. And Calvin wants to start then with the grace and love of God, which then makes it possible for us to come to terms with the fact that we are, as Bart says, curved in on ourselves, in some ways incapable of living well in our diversity because of our own self-interest. But at the same time, it is being overcome in a baptismal identity, which says there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, which of course there is, but it's being transcended, it's being overcome by the reality of God's grace in Jesus Christ. 
And in the end, this is the last word addressed to, to theological education. Sometimes I think we have, we've been too certain. Education is in the business of kind of bringing us to some clarity about how we think. But I want to end by saying that the tradition, our tradition, the reform tradition also holds deeply to the inscrutability of God and the ineffability of God. And if we're in God's image, it means we're also inscrutable. And we're also always being made and unmade, done and undone in our personhood and remade dying and rising into more fully the life of Jesus Christ and the triune God. And so it's my hope for theological education. And I'm grateful for New Brunswick's journey through this really complex diversity and particularity and how it's formed a lot of people to live from the grace of God. constantly being made and unmade. <laughs> oh, gee. Okay, so we don't have, it's not like we have any big things to unpack here, but um, just huge things. Um, yeah. It's now where we open things up. You, you need to either press the little raise your hand button or put your name in the Q&A if you can't find your raise your hand button. Um, and I can call on you and bring you into the conversation. Go ahead, Anne. Hey there. Um, I really appreciated listening to all of you. And in the model of um, action reflection, I'm um, growing in my own awareness that I'm learning through like the things that I wish I had known sooner or maybe a more direct way of saying is it my mistakes. but. I was wondering if each of you could go back knowing what you know now, what would be something that you would do differently? Since I recognize the voice, <laughs> my sense is that I was not always very good at listening to the faculty. I think I needed uh, much more to involve them more actively. Uh, Part of my hesitance to do that, I think, was their own suggestion that they were already busy enough and they paid administrators to do a lot of that. But there, there should have been, in the years that I was president, a better, more efficient way, uh, a deeper way of listening to the faculty. I think, uh, Anne. Hi, Anne. Uh, I think it, I'm still learning this in the work of wedded to, I have I am wedded to certain um, efficiencies and getting things done and I'm not patient all the time. I remember you asking me in class one time, how do you um, respond when somebody has you know, said something or done something really outrageous, how do you sort of manage yourself? And I said to you, count to 10. And now I would say, count to a thousand and then do it again and then do it again. That the work of learning, the work of being together as human beings in our particularity requires that sort of constant patient listening with one another and, um, I think, you know, as the dean of the seminary, I just, as, as your father has just said, you, we had plenty to do. And it was, it was often difficult because we had to get things done as we do also in uh, congregational ministry to just say, we're not gonna get it done yet. Uh, we need to, we just need to hang out here for a while. And I hate that. And I hate COVID. COVID for this reason. I feel like, gosh, we're just hanging out. And there's stuff that I, I just want to move forward with and get done. So maybe it's about the patience of God, patience of Jesus. <laughs> uh, 
How's that? Better. Okay, great. It's like Joanne controls whether you speak or not. <laughs> I'm sure she'd like to. <laughs> I'd like to do that in the political re arena as well, when some people speak too much. Um, I don't know. It, it, it's, it was a long time ago for me. And uh, I haven't spent a whole lot of time reflecting on it since I left the seminary. Uh, I did speak about the, the pain of a, of a terrible retrenchment. And I guess I wondered at the time, it, I just almost forced it to be done. Uh, knowing the pain involved and, and the feelings of the people, I don't think I was pastoral then because I just felt there's no easy way to do this and it has to be done. But maybe I was wrong and a more pastoral approach well, would have been more effective and faithful. Can I just respond to Bob? Sure. Because I know I remember being so pissed at you as a student. We were so upset because some of our favorite people were being let go from the faculty. But I want to say now undo what I just said about patience. There are these moments where you really do need to do the hard thing. Um, and it, I, I feel like it needed to be done on lots of levels and it's having been done is part of what opened up this, this way of being and being pushed into, further into what Howard had envisioned and just hanging in there to get that to happen. And you were the one who made it board, the board policy that the next four faculty appointments after you came on would be people of color which was huge, it was absolutely huge. Um, and I think defining for the future of this school. <laughs> and it wasn't until we had, um, you know, I'll say black bodies that we could really begin to do the, the very difficult work of anti-racist education. It was urgent in the same way it's urgent now in our culture. Somebody right. needs to somebody needs to do the hard thing. Dr. McCreary, who gets to have the hot seat now, um, has, his, has had his hand up for a little bit. So I'm going to invite him to talk. Good afternoon, all. It's a pleasure to hear you all and, and be here with you all. There's an African proverb that says, Standing upon your shoulders, I can see twice as far. And on your shoulders, um, I'm very grateful and thank you for that. One question I had um, as you all were talking was, while serving New Brunswick Theological Seminary in your positions, how did each of you handle the denominational ecumenical dichotomy that seems to be existing? Thank you. Well, Let's go historically uh, and let the old man talk first. Uh, John Coakley, in his History of the Seminary, does a really good job of delineating how successive presidents dealt with the tension of being denominational while increasingly being ecumenical. Uh, and it's a tough, tough part of the presidency there, even today, I assume. And, and I'm, I'm glad, uh, Micah, that you have decided to affiliate with the Reformed Church because it's, it's still an, an issue uh, of how we relate to our mother church while uh, providing leadership and being part of the mission of our, our church. Uh, so... Yeah, you know, I, I I wrestled with it all the time in my time there. Bob, Bob, don't you think though that in your days at New Brunswick and in mine, 
the church itself was more naturally ecumenical. Yes. It, it was um, a, a given that uh, people would argue about membership in the World Council, National Council of Churches, but the denomination would stay. The, 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 the core of, of the body would stay involved with the broader church. That's a piece that I'm increasingly uh, afraid is not so natural to the RCA today. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think New Brunswick Seminary can play a major leadership role in how the future is shaped for the Reformed Church uh, to, con to continue to be Reformed, which means being ecumenical and being involved in the, the cause of justice in society and inclusiveness and, and all of that. I hope the seminary's role will be to support that part of who we are today, uh, while the other part goes another way. We're far more conservative and reactionary as a society today than we were 20, 30 right. years ago. Yeah. And uh, we need the seminary uh, to help us, help us in this uh, far more uh, awful future. I just, I just think about the election that's coming, and uh, I grew this beard as an act of protest, and shame, and I can't wait to shave it off when a new, different president's elected. Sorry for that. I would just say when um, you, you know we began in the midst of the increasing denominational or, or religious tradition diversity to realize that's when the the uh, reformed church center comes into being and we have denominational studies as an explicit part of the curriculum and i was talking to beth johnson who was the first female person appointed to the faculty while bob was the president that we were always struggling with students because we had a sense that they weren't well formed in the reformed tradition they didn't understand it. And so we were trying to do way too much in way too little time as a seminary because we wanted to introduce students to an ecumenical understanding of church history and theology. And, and that's what I'm talking about before in terms of the particularity that our capacity to be engaged helpfully in a dialogue in diversity means that we've got to have some clarity about who we are, where we stand, what is the gift that we bring? So it's not adversarial. We just understood that there's all of this gift, all this gift of spirit in a variety of traditions and we, we can bring it together. And in the dialogue, we become also changed, I think. That's the making and the unmaking, the holding and the letting go that is a part of the work. I know that we are beyond our time. Um, as long as our panelists are willing to hang around and talk, I'm going to invite people to continue to ask questions. Um, I will not. I will not say anything about how when we when we bring in somebody from Fuller for a Reformed Church Center program, we end early. When we bring in some people, three people from New Brunswick, we run long. But that's okay. Um, right, Patricia Johnson. Time. Patricia Johnson. As, Welcome you to ask your question. Go ahead and unmute. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. I, um, I don't have a question per se. I, I have a comment and, and basically my comments are of, um, of gratitude to the three of you. Um, I began at New Brunswick in, in 2018. Um, I'm a native New Yorker. Um, this is, I guess, my second career. I'm not quite sure um, where my education will lead me, but I've always had God in my life. I was not raised in RCA. Um, and as a New Yorker, I, you know, there are different enclaves, neighborhoods, and so on. 
Um, so I was raised in a diverse, with a diverse mind in a sense, um, different schools, um, educational settings, um, churches and so on. So I've always believed and I keep hearing from you all about diversity and everyone that I've met, even when I interviewed with New Brunswick was, um, I said, I believe in diversity. I, you know, raised my children with diversity. So it's just been God that has led me to Arthur Caliandro's church mm -hmm. in the city, which I never would have thought I would have stepped into on Fifth Avenue, being a black woman. Um, but with technology, seeing a black woman on the chancel at this time in, when was I there, about nine years ago? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, about 11 years ago. And I was pretty much blown away. And I said, I think I can step foot in this church on Fifth Avenue and 29th Street. And it, it was just a welcoming um, RCA experience. And it's just been, it's just grown. And, you know, I hear Renee House and, you know, the first woman to speak at Synod. And um, I'm involved with women transformation and leadership at this time. So I thank you and applaud you for, for your um, your initiative um, and what you're standing for. Um, and um, I never would have thought I'd, I'd speak to um, um, this audience, but I, um, you know, I've only known, well, Dr. McCreary since I've been there and it's just been fabulous, but you as um, four, I'll say four fathers being a little sexist of that you all led, um, you know, New Brunswick, but you, you had the courage. And that's the other thing I want to say is, you know, I, I, well, God implants what he implants in us. And I think that you all had um, insightfulness and the courage to take the, the, the steps that you did to bring it to where it is that I am now able to um, experience um, seminary, which I would have, I had my uh, thoughts about what seminary would be of nothing that I would ever be able to um, experience. Um, um, mostly, again, because of the ethnic, ethnicity, the background and that sort of thing. And, um, and, and so just my whole experience at New Brunswick has just been always awe-inspiring, always continues to be. And I just want to say thank you. That's all. Thank you, Patricia. Kent McCurd has a question, and I'm going to invite him to unmute and ask it. I don't know what, Kent is having an audio problem. I am going to go ahead and ask the question because he typed it into the Q&A. Okay. Um, he says, first, what a pleasure it was to listen to all of you and see you. I join with the expression of our wish that Greg and Alan were still with us in the flesh. Here mm -hmm. is my question. The three of you were, allowed, were invited to speak at a commencement service at NBTS, or I guess if the three of you were invited to speak at a commencement service at NBTS, what advice would you give to the class of 2021? Okay, the youngest can go first. Um, hi, Kent. Uh, I was at a installation on Sunday for somebody who's just coming into our classes and the sermon was preached by Eric Titus, who has just spent a year basically incapacitated because of liver transplant and complications. And his, his word was, um, cast your bread upon the waters. Cast your bread, bread upon the waters because you never know. You know. So sort of just sow the word, do the gospel, don't hesitate. And a group of us were talking yesterday, and one of my colleagues who was at the installation said, you know, if I had had to preach, I would have said, um, you're justified by God. And don't get caught up in the ministry with counting heads. Mm -hmm. It's hard to judge one's own faithfulness as a minister, especially in the complexity that we're in. Um, but one of the defaults is uh, the ways we think about success is 
we got a lot of people. So that, that landed on me because it's a constant temptation um, to measure success. And I've been thinking a lot lately about, we don't have an adequate theology of the cross, I think in the reformed tradition, or maybe it's hidden in there some way, but that, you know, we too have been tempted as Christians in America to think about the gospel in terms of success and I think a lot about the theology of the cross and ministry and what it means. I have been very struck in recent years by the fact that people believe that, first of all, that God is angry, that uh, God's attention has to be earned or at least attracted. And I'm on a campaign to, to say God is not angry. Jesus took care of all that anger and placed us in a position where we're totally safe forever. And that the, the work of gospel is not to talk people into conversion, but to enjoyment of the position of being already converted by God's grace. And it will not surprise any of you uh, whose faces I am now seeing on the, the monitor that uh, I keep coming back to the first answer, uh, a question and answer of the catechism. First question is important, but the answer is even more important. So I'm not my own. It's all been taken care of. I don't have to worry about a relationship with God. God assures forever that I, that I have one and can enjoy it. Coming from, from South Holland, Illinois, we would say, yeah, we'll, we'll have a good time. We just won't enjoy it. <laughs> it's time for us to enjoy our good time. I would say you're called to be a pastor, but you're also called in this time to be a prophet. And the best way to be a prophet is pastorally. I have just discovered how to unmute. So thank <laughs> you for your response. And thank you for being present with us here today. God bless each and every one of you. And you. Thank you, Kent. Thank Good you, to Kent. Hear your voice. Scott Crane has had his hand patiently raised. And so oh, I'm going my to. Oh, goodness, Scott Crane. <laughs> oh, um, Another one of that great class. Yes, I, I just want to tell Bob, yes, I'm still shoveling snow. Um, <laughs> I don't know. How that speaks to my success or not, uh, but still trying to model those things. You know, when I came to seminary, it was a non-traditional student. I had gone to Northwestern College under the Orange Water Tower of Orange City, Iowa. I had had a mixed background of Pentecostalism and Methodism and First Christian Discipleship and really was worried, you know, about these uh, Dutch Reformed people. Uh, I think it was Marlon Vanderwilt that suggested I come to New Brunswick where I could learn more about the history on the East Coast. Uh, I remember uh, Renee escorting us around New York City, and I believe we even ran into Mon Madonna um, on the whirlwind tour. Um, and when I got there, I guess one of my concerns was that, you know, we were talking about black theology and feminist theology, and here I was an old white guy that uh, wasn't even Dutch. Um, and yet I heard the stories of those around me and realized that we were all on this journey together. And I think for me, that was really what it was, was that everybody had made themselves vulnerable to engage on the meaning of life, but also where it was for us contextually. Now, over the years, um, I have really gotten into church family systems throughout my time in the RCA, as well as my time now in the Presbyterian Church USA. I've always been on committees working with churches 
uh, currently on a committee on ministry and facilitating congregational support. And my question really deals with that family church system in the midst of anxiety everywhere I go. Um, my gift is that of conflict, um, sometimes trying to relieve the anxiety, but trying to challenge them to grow, grow farther from the status quo increases anxiety, um, which we all know. Um, I guess my concern today in our world where we have to talk about being self-differentiated, understanding emotional intelligence, um, Bob alluded to being more pastoral, um, and where a prophet sometimes we think is not so much of laying my head down to be killed, but to throw rocks at everybody else. Um, how do we bring our vulnerability to a world that so desperately needs it? when so many people now want to be top down and are more worried about winning the debate than um, entering into uh, the arena and being more Christ-like, I guess. Um, I know that's kind of a long way to get to that question. Um, I know that Brene Brown is probably a big person that a lot of people speak to for that. But I think in our church, uh, we need that vulnerability if people are going to feel safe and be able to grow. So I guess... You know, how, how do we do that in our world today and in our churches? Well, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I remember once when you made yourself very vulnerable at the seminary uh, in Sage Library, all those portraits of all the great old professors hang on the, the railing of the upper gallery and you were vulnerable enough to blow up a big picture of yourself, put it in a frame and sneak in and hang yourself off the rail of the gallery. Now that's vulnerability. <laughs> where, where did that picture go? It almost made it to first Schenectady when you were there, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's still there. It must be in the archives. Yeah. I would say, Scott, I'm thinking about James Allison, who's doing such amazing theological stuff right now. And somebody asked him where he found the courage as a Catholic to speak out in the ways that he is speaking of, to do theological reflection on queer inclusion and his response was i died and rose with jesus christ the worst has already happened nothing worse can come and so he found both this um, incredible courage but also this vulnerability that you can let people kill you you can Put yourself out there without defenses because you've already died and you've already risen so it's all done yes i appreciate that i think now one might speak to that with attention as well so again i think you know encouraging other people to do that to to not be afraid but no they are with christ thank you yeah. Jan Fritzinger has sent us a question. She is she is on with us, but um, she is at work, and so she can't ask questions out loud right now. Um, her question, what words would you give to the classes to encourage young people to enter into ministry and to attend New Brunswick? The 9-11, the which, which Norman referenced, um, there was a huge uptick in people coming to seminary as well as church post 9-11. So while on the one hand, it has complexified our ministries pretty a lot to be in COVID and everything, it is also the case that people are coming and a sense of call um, comes out of this kind of a crisis, I think. You look at Bonhoeffer and these guys post-World War II that we do better theology out of these crises. We do better church out of crises than when we're just complacent. So I think it's um, on the, it's kind of an exciting time to do ministry just because it feels so essential and people are so eager for hope and community and a place to stand. And if you want to learn how to do the, to do ministry 
with genuine diversity, you go to New Brunswick and you sit through all the uncomfortableness of doing anti-racist work and being deconstructed and reconstructed. And, and perhaps classes need to learn that call can't be created. Call happens when, when God speaks to individuals and even classes can't speak like that. <laughs> Dwayne Jackson, another person patiently waiting. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hello, everybody. Um, for all of you, you have been such a great part of my seminary journey. I started out with Bob and graduated on the norm, and uh, I made Norm and Renee cry at graduation, which was one of those <laughs> highlight moments in my life. So thank you all. My question is, many of us have been on these forums since we have graduated seminary, and the the topic is normally things they didn't teach us in seminary or things that seminary did not prepare us for. But as we look forward to the future and even now, if you had to do it all over again, or what advice would you give uh, Dr. McCreary for New Brunswick as we look to the future on things that they can do to make sure that their graduates are as well equipped for what they're going to face as the uh, as they look forward to doing ministry in this world we're living in now. I would encourage students to realize that at whatever age uh, they may be, seminary is the beginning of the journey and not the end. There are things that one is not prepared uh, to uh, consider uh, when you're in seminary, you have to be in ministry a while before some questions uh, arise and, and can be answered. So lifelong learning and practice of ministry is essential to stay alive in ministry. Yeah, I would say, I would add, you know, there was a vision when uh, uh, Howard came into the seminary. He envisioned a classroom where there would be lay people and people preparing for full-time ministry and also ministers in the classroom together, of course, because New Brunswick had a lot of people already in ministry in the classroom, you know, virtually everybody from the African-American traditions when we started. Um, I... I was talking again to these colleagues yesterday, and we did, we find ourselves without time to read. Maybe it's discipline. I don't know. It's it's just so much that sometimes I think oh, it'd be great if the seminary had classes that um, you know ministers could be invited into, or we might even suggest some courses that we would really like to engage in, and then we would have the discipline of a weekly being together in a community of learning. And I know Fred Mould said when I was a student, James might remember, you know, the classes should be doing this for ministers, organizing learning opportunities for ministers, but we're the ones who would have to do it. <laughs> sort of need somebody else to help us with that. I'm not sure I have anything to add to those two, two wonderful suggestions. <laughs> I remember, um, not too long ago, the last few years of my parish ministry, I was blessed to have one of my other classmates, David Jones, down the road from me. Mm -hmm. um, and it meant that it also meant that when we were in classes meetings, dealing with the kind of stuff that you deal with in classes meetings and in committee meetings, he had to deal with it with me. And after one particular meeting where I, I honestly cannot remember what it was that we had had to unravel, but I do, I do remember that at the end of the meeting, we were sitting outside of David's office and um, looking at each other, kind of like, what just happened? <laughs> and we talked about, and one of us said something about, you know, this is one of those things seminary never trained us for. 
And David very wisely said, you know, it, it was his reflection that is um, the most important thing we learn in seminary is how to learn to do things while they're already going on. Mm -hmm. um, as if, you know, as if you were on the plane and it's, you know, it's flying at 30,000 feet and now you have to fix the engine. And this is what we do. This is what we have to do in ministry. And that seminary kind of teaches us to learn and improvise. And that may also have been a special blessing for the class of 87 because we were through that time at New Brunswick, but I think that still goes on. And it's something I still tell students. I need to bring us in for a landing now and um, thank everybody for being here. Um, all of the people who've been here and listening and dialoguing with us are three wonderful panelists. Um, Kathy Proctor, who takes care of advancement at the seminary these days, reminded me while everybody else was speaking to thank those of you who have made donations to the support the work of the Reformed Church Center in its 20th anniversary year for doing that and to invite all of you who haven't had a chance to do that yet to go ahead and do that. And I can tell all of you who've been participants that you're going to get a lovely follow-up note um, tomorrow thanks to Zoom's um, features for webinars. And the follow-up note will have something about that in it and we'll have a handy dandy link and all you'll have to do is click on it and you'll find the place to go. So I invite you to do that. I thank you everybody for being here. I wish you a blessed rest of your day and rest of your week and I hope to see you again very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.